Hello folks, thanks for joining us here with the wonderful Claire Timney, fellow All Saints club mate and current Breda captain. Claire, a fantastic career so far. Who was the first time you came up against a player that gave you a roast and who was it? Um, yeah, it was, I I had played for, De- for, for, for Antrim, sorry, for from when I was 14 at, the same, at a senior level. And so that was probably my first sort of introduction to, you know, like top, top class players but it's probably a few years into play, playing county football but I was marked by Cathy Conway and um, so I would have generally played centre half forward and Cathy Conway was is and probably was one of the best centre half backs I've ever played against and we had so many battles over the years with Derry and Cathy was always just such a stalwart for, for them and so like for me I actually think probably playing against her probably a few times a year made me a better player because I knew that I had to get out in front of her and I and I had that I had to be winning the ball but she was also one of those half half backs that would always get forward and as a forward you, you hate that because you you don't want to have to chase yeah. nearly your your def- the defender and I'm generally a, a half forward that would sort of play a would be a playmaker role and sort of would sit in that half forward line so I always hated when when she would be marking me but um she was fantastic and she went on to be um a teammate of mine in uh, Jordanstown and and um and Breda as well so I, I really kind of got to know her but she was she's just such a, she was such a fantastic player and the, the junior junior ladies generally wouldn't have um, received all-star nominations and she, she actually did um, but it was a testament to her because she was such a fantastic player you know so um, she definitely she, it, it was great kind of getting to play against someone like Cathy. Unreal and did you say 14 was your first senior kind of mm-hmm. call where were you Pardon? when you were- when, where were you when you found that out? I was playing for I was playing for Balamina senior ladies, but I was also playing for Money Glass under I think fourteens as well. Um, because Balamina didn't have an under fourteen team, so I was starting to get involved in the in the county setup at that stage. It was a guy Anthony. Oh gosh, what's his surname from Glenavy? I think that that gave me had asked me to come up into the senior team and. I remember we went down to play. I think one of the first games I went to play was against Dublin B team. And we were playing in the National League. Yeah, like at that stage, the, the Dublin had a B team. Um, and so that that was a real baptism of fire too, going into that, like when you're 14. But at that stage, you have no fear, you know, so you, you kind of are going out. You don't know who any of these people are really. And he was just telling me just to go and run and get on the ball. So, but I, but I loved it. And that was, yeah, that, that was my sort of first introduction to county football. And then obviously I, I sort of played with county up until I was about, I think about 28. So I, I think I had, I had played for Balamina for a number of years up until Balamina folded. Um, but, and then I moved on and, and played for Breda um, for the last sort of 10 years. And I think, I think Antrim was almost, almost felt like my club in some ways because I had played with them from when I was 14. So yeah. I was uh, like hugely passionate about, about Antrim um, as well. So yeah, it started, started when I was 14. I don't think you would get too many 14 year olds playing no. at the moment for county senior teams. Tell me, so it sounds like you, like well, people when they get their first call up to the county or a higher level club, they maybe don't start. They don't start in a team. Sorry. So did you go straight in and start? Yeah, gen, gen, uh, generally I, I was from 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 memory, and uh, not that my memory is great, but yeah, I I was starting on the team. Yeah, so um, I was pretty fortunate to kind of, and that probably, to be honest, kind of made me into the player that I was. You know, playing at that young age, you know, again, sort of bit you know, bigger, bigger girls and, and sort of learning from that. And like I remember Money Glass at the time, um, where were the team in Antrim that they had gone on to Ulster and won many titles and they were a force to be reckoned with. So I became quite friendly, like at a young age with the likes of the McCann sisters and like other AP McCoy's um, sister as well. She was playing for the team and on, like unbelievable like team that they had but I learned so much from them and you know I think that really helped me along the way and they really welcomed me into their into the team as well so um Antrim was sort of they were sprinkled with a lot of those money glass girls as well so um yeah so it was it was great like it, like well when I think back like being about 14 15 and being on the county bus and like god what an eye-opener like at times but um 
all those experiences definitely like kind of make you into sort of what what you are like you know As who was in that dressing room were the older players there and you know did anyone take you under their wing and give you some good advice that you really learned from the McCann sisters Jordan Jordan and Mary McCann actually maybe not necessarily from what they would have been saying but just how did they kind of um, carried themselves in the team I'm sure you know the McCanns in in um, from Corrigan and like as a family even themselves that how they carry themselves on the pitch is there's that like never say die attitude and that you know that grit and hunger is unbelievable like you, ca- you can't teach that almost so to sort of see you know players you know performing in that way and, and going through people for a shortcut you know they you know they I think just from sort of watching and playing under those girls it taught me so much you know I I feel like I almost feel like that's lacking a little bit in today's game in some ways I think we nearly need more of that like hunger and determination and like you know training there would never have been a complaint when I would have went to training like I'll never forget training I think at Halloween it was the 31st of October and the fireworks were going off and we were literally running up and down hell like bog and women's football obviously just by the way things have been over the last number of years you know you'd be on the back pitch that literally might not be used too much so like but in some ways it probably did us no harm too because you know you were it was probably the worst conditions that that you were you were actually training on but like I just remember the running that you would have been doing but no one complained like no one complained at all and I think that that has stuck with me a lot and and I feel like now when I'm going to training I kind of expect and have that standard where we should be going out and we should be you know people need to be pushed and need need to be challenged and being you know put in put out of their comfort zone so yeah th- those girls certainly I think the county girls particularly because I was kind of at that age and I would have been impressionable and just watching all around all around you um and then Jordy McCann um is a, is a, a good friend of mine so like we she, I've never met a woman who likes to talk more about football so I mean we've over the years we just talk football oh constantly so yeah like it, it's good to have those good you know people around you and sounding boards and, and they definitely set the way as to you know how I wanted to be as a player too. You know who were the role models for you growing up and you talk about you talked about asking for feedback you know would you have been one to go to a role they'd be the role models of the team and ask for feedback things like that as well? I, I, do you know it's funny I think that I, I probably wouldn't have but and it's only as you get older I think you kind of grow in confidence that you sort of want to go and ask for feedback and it's something that I think is so I think it's so critical for people's development that you have got to go and ask for feedback and I think in ladies football um, I've been helping out with Queen's ladies um, just last year and this year and it's something I'm trying to um, implement is is you know taking each player and looking at, the, at them and what can they improve and and pe- everyone needs feedback and um, you know there is no perfect or perfect player so I feel like I should I probably should have gone for um for, for more feedback but as a as a person I would always be really critical on myself anyway and I, I felt in some ways I almost knew where my imperfections lay and so I, I always was trying to improve you know certain areas of my game because I felt like I knew I, I always knew myself where I was falling down um but in terms of role models and it's something that I I think um, it's really important that we are getting more women involved and and in front of the camera and, you know, this 2020 movement um, is, has been really important to try and improve um, sort of women in sport and participation in sport. And because we haven't had role models, like when I was growing up, we wouldn't have had any female role. I wouldn't have had female role models. Like when when you would ask me who my role models were, it would have been David Beckham and Anthony Toll, um, the Derry midfielder. And, you know, there wouldn't have been too many women. So like, I think it's, it's brilliant that there's been a real drive to have more women, you know, in front of the camera and, and for women's sport to be shown so that like young girls can have role models, you know, because they, they have like, you know, if you're not seeing women out there doing it, you know, I think that doesn't really help women's sports. So, um, but I mean, certainly, you know, everyone has those sporting heroes that you're sort of aspiring to be. And I actually played a lot of tennis when I was younger as well. And Serena Williams was was obviously was always a role model too. And um, always thought I might make it at some point, but 
didn't quite go down that route, but um, yet, yeah, well, I don't know about that. But yeah, I suppose it's, it's seeing those powerful women in in sport, you know, is is such a driving force for young girls. So um, yeah, those kind of would have been my role models. But I do think it's it's very important. You know, going into mm-hmm. your younger years, come from a great family. What type of roles did they play in your sporting career? My mom and dad have been hugely supportive, and I probably haven't given them enough uh, credit over the years. You know, they've been just they've always sort of let me play whatever I wanted to play and like from a young age like I would remember my dad um kicking the ball to me like we lived in Derry City when I was younger and uh, like I just remember my dad constantly kicking the ball I always had a ball in my hand and that was from a very very young age so you know the, that was hugely important and I suppose you know if I was going to have kids I think I would be doing the same thing as well you know that's it's I think that probably was the key to to getting for me to having a love for for the football in some ways because I never had a ball out of my hands then after that so that was that was so important and and you know taking that time that they would have they just would have spent so much time you know kicking ball and like I even over the years even when I've got older I always remember like my dad coming out and kicking kicking the ball and you could be standing kicking the ball for hours just back and forth back and forth but you know yeah, that's what he would have done, and like my mom as well. Like they would, they would have been. I remember like we we would have walked a lot when I was younger, and like we, my mom and dad would be telling me, you know, like let's see how fast you can go to the next lamppost. So like I was always and always trying to get faster, and you know they'd be telling telling me I was getting faster as well. So like, all of those like small things, you know, like I suppose that was starting to get that competitiveness, you, you know, going as well, and. Um, Sorry, interrupt you there. Pardon? Were you roughly at this stage, just your primary school? Sorry, primary school years? Yeah, I was in primary school. I probably would have been about six or seven, you know, that age. Like, you know, when you're so impressionable and you're like, oh, yes, I'll uh, run to that next lamppost or whatever. So it was obviously just a technique to get me home to wherever. (laughs) But, you know, it it worked. And, yeah, they've just, they've always been massive supporters in me. And, like, I'll always remember my dad standing behind the goals Um a lot of Balamina games uh, in the earlier years, you know, when he would stand with his hands up right smack bang down the centre of the goals just to be like, pass me the ball. So, you know, that's what I was aiming for, to, to pass the ball over the bar to him. You, you know, say that, so, uh, like in training or did you say in games? You know, be like- this was in games too. Yes, it would be in games, yeah. So I don't know if you'd be allowed to stand behind the net now, but like, you know, that sort of, and all those little, all those like small things, you know, would make, do make such a difference, you know. So, and I suppose it's only when you sort of reflect on them, you know, now that you, you see that. And, but like, I would have always heard my dad on the sideline too. And I, that always drove me on, you know, hearing him. And my parents are, are such positive people. And that has been instilled in me. Like, I know that that's a big part of my game is, you know, being positive and, and praising people, you know, like we all know when you make a mistake, like you don't need someone, you don't need the person beside you to be like, how are you doing? You know, like always, you know, pick yourself up and dust yourself off. And like, I think a lot of those things, it's funny because even um, I was playing in the Ulster Championship last Sunday for Breda. We've been obviously coming to the business end of the year. And it was funny, like I was starting to think about, you know, you're thinking about your team talk and what you're going to say. And we were up, we were playing against Dunamoyne, which are one of the best teams in Ireland. And, and one of the things I was just thinking about was like, my dad always told me, don't panic like that the number one rule in life was don't panic and I was sort of thinking like that is what like in in the game scenario that we need to not panic you know when the going gets tough or the pressure is on don't panic like that is like there there are all those little life lessons that I suppose as you kind of get older you sort of see you know where they've come into play and they've been yeah my 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 parents have been massive what type of sports did you play growing up I mean I think I tried my hand at quite a few things I had a very short Irish dancing career. I think that lasted two weeks, maybe. Uh, I think I was, I think I, I um, had gone into gymnastics, um, even, which um, for a little, very, very short time. And then um, I suppose I found football and that was for me then just something that I loved. So I played soccer um, and I played Gaelic like, football, but I also played a lot of tennis. Um, and I remember one, one summer when I was probably about, nine or ten and I 
we traveled around with all of Northern Ireland to different tennis tournaments during the summer. Yeah, so I I was I I loved tennis. Um and but and I was probably at a point actually when I when we moved from Derry City to to Balamina, I was actually playing playing um tennis more so than anything else. Um and it was only then when I got involved. It was actually it's funny too because in, in our in I went to St. Louis Grammar School and first to fourth year the girl ladies weren't allowed to play soccer there was no team for so but if there had have been a team I would have played mm-hmm. um and because I didn't play then until my fourth year when I was allowed to play um that was it was only sort of around then that I was getting involved then with Balamine All Stars the, the team outside of school as well so I think school probably had a big impact on what I was playing um but yeah, I played tennis for a number of years and then football really just started to take over and um, both soccer and Gaelic and just my love for those those two sports um, took over and they were just, they obviously took up a lot of my time. So you can only do so much and even playing two sports for, for a long time, you know, it, it is tricky um, as well. But, you know, I suppose that's the thing when you love two sports playing, it's very hard then to, to make a decision on, on what to give up as such but or what to focus on but I think having that variety at a young age is really important and you know allowing kids to sort of see well what are they interested in you know and there's so many very I think I I went to a course recently um about um girls playing sport and the number one thing is for people to have fun Mm -hmm. you know people want to be having fun at that young it's fun and making friends and so you know, whatever environment is going to be best for kids to do that is probably what they're going to gravitate to most, you know. So I do think it is really important to, to, have, op- to have options and for them to, to naturally then choose their, their own path. So you kicked on in St. Louis and you're playing both for All Saints, Balamina, and you're also playing for the school. Mm-hmm. Bill Sisters playing the team with you, Lizzie and Lauren, but they, you know, they talked greatly about your leadership where do you think mm-hmm. your, your, your leadership skills come come from? And- I suppose, I think probably I would I probably wouldn't be a player that would speak. You know, I wouldn't be very aggressive on the pitch. You know, and I I suppose I probably done a lot of my talking through my how I played really in some ways. And I think probably playing for Balamina um probably was was a player that you know is in a forward line that I knew I was sort of being depended on in some ways. And that was probably from a young age in some ways. So I think that that actually probably without realizing helped me kind of develop leadership skills that I knew that I had to perform. Um, you know, so and I taken on sort of pressure, not pressure, but not realizing maybe pressure at a younger age, then kind of I as I kind of grew older, I had expectation you know that I that I would perform and I would and I think that probably going with that and sort of being able to to carry that in my game and and to know that you know I needed to perform that just through playing I I think I, I sort of developed that sort of leadership in some ways too um so I would say I would say probably it would it was really in that and knowing that it's probably the expectation I set myself as well because I would have high expectations um, and I, I would get annoyed at myself and like I would be the first one coming off the pitch telling you X, Y, and Z what I what I didn't do in that game, you know. So um I think it's probably just from from growing up and probably playing, you know, maybe playing county football at, at 14, you know, when you're playing at that age and you're sort of playing at that higher level and knowing that you're playing at that higher level, it gives me confidence, you know. So I think those all played a part. Big see for any parents out there. To a nervous father uh, who who maybe feels that uh, for when he's when he's helping bring up his daughter in sport, should he treat them any different than he would if he had a son in terms of the feedback? You know, because I know that some fathers out there may be listening. Going, should I be a wee bit? You know, you said you know, should I be a wee bit different when I'm raising my daughter in sport compared to my son? Or what advice would you give to them? Um, I think it. I think, I think definitely sort of as I was sort of saying, like start on a positive and finish on a positive, you know, and I think as long as you have like positive, positivity kind of throughout that, um, but there's areas where, you know, they can critique and then sort of maybe take them and say, right, let's, we'll go out and, you know, say for example, blocking is a problem or, you know, something that they need to work on, go out and block the ball, you know, so I suppose it, 
rather than just you know given given sort of the problems you know have a solution to the problems you know help find the solution to the problems and um, so i think it's you know be mindful of, of what you're saying as well because we are very sensitive at times and like i have heard you know sometimes fathers give dogs abuse i don't think it helps um, at times like there's a way of being straight up and, and, and saying right this is where you need to work on um, but so I think it's just and just the language that you use because as kids I think growing up you listen to everything that your parents say mm -hmm. you know so I think just you know being positive you know throughout but then also sort of saying right this is what this is what and this is how we are going we're going to overcome this you know you need to improve on your shooting okay, well, we'll go down, let's go down, you know, to the pitch or whatever, you know, to, for the next few weeks, every sort of other night or whatever. And I suppose it's just investing that time. Um, and it's practice. Practice really does make perfect and or is close to perfect, you know. Like, I think you just have got to be practicing, practicing, practicing for you to improve. It's not going to, those things just don't improve overnight. So I think it's just encouraging, you know, kids and to do the extra kind of work, you know, maybe if they're going to training and they're feeling there are certain areas of their game that they need to work on then you know, taking them and spending that time with them outside of training. Technically, one of the best players I've ever seen, it came from putting in the hours up at the pitch. So talk us through mm -hmm. those extra training sessions you were doing? Um, I, th I think, well, I suppose one thing that definitely helped me, I think, in terms of technique is playing a lot of football at a young age, playing out on the street with boys. That, like, I think you always have to be challenging yourself as a player to be playing with better players. And I think that's the only way to nearly improve. Um, so I spent, I spent most nights out playing in the street um, with the boys playing football, playing knockout and different things. And this I think that... Was this in Balmain? Pardon? Was this when you were living this in... Would have been in... This would have been in Derry, yeah. yeah. I, we were fortunate to live in like a cul-de-sac sort of area, so there wouldn't have been too much traffic around. So we, were, we, just, we just played constantly. Um, and so that was kind of where the love of the game came for me but then when I when we moved then to Balamina we, we lived in a road so there was there was none of that um playing with the lads in the street or whatever so it, that came down to I literally would have went out for hours and kicked the ball off the wall like constantly and sort of it wouldn't have been in terms of like I wouldn't have really you know had 10 reps or whatever it was just sort of continual and I would you know I would maybe go inside and then I'd go outside and I you know at different times um, and I did that right up through my A levels even as well like I would have went outside and there would have been maybe an area on the wall that I would be aiming for mm -hmm. and I would have been trying to sort of aim for that every time and it would be whether you were punt passing or whether you would be sort of like hooking the ball or, or you know, all the different sort of techniques of, of passing the ball to that one particular spot. So it's it's things like that, I, I think, you know, that really build on your technique. And it's actually at a young age that your t technique, that's where you're going to develop your technique. Um, and I think you certainly can improve that and spend more time as you kind of get through Get, get older and get in through your 20s. But I think that technique at a young age is really important, but it's spending like it's spending those hours and it's not something that you can really force anyone to do it. it I think it is innate that you need, you know, players will, you know, go out and want to hit the ball off, off the wall or whatever and have a ball in their hands at, at all times. And so I think even like say, I, I, I think I just naturally wanted to, I just love playing so much that I like wanted to go out and do these things. Like even chipping the ball, like, you know, running and chipping the ball up without having to kind of, you know, bend down. And those are things you just you just doing more and more, you know, you know, just out in the garden or whatever. So I, I think a lot of those things kind of came as I got older. But then I suppose, like for example, I became a free take I would have became a free taker a number of years ago. And um I was fortunate enough that Oshin McConville came in to take a free taking session. Um, and obviously Oshin was a phenomenal free taker for our man Cross McGlenn. And you know, he 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 sort of said, have a set routine that you're going to do mm -hmm. and stick to it. And when you have like a process, then if you follow the process every time, there's less thinking nearly that goes into it in some way. So 
your nerves and things like that you know where you're you know you can have these thoughts when you're taking breaks of oh god am i gonna am i gonna miss this one or you know whatever whereas if you have a process and you follow that step by step every single time it just it happens and i find that i i i realize that one like number i'd say about 10 15 years ago that my my probability of scoring was much higher when I would be on the turn, when I would, when I would kick the ball in the turn. So I have this, um, my sort of technique would be, my back would be to the goal. And I find that I was, I would literally wouldn't even have to look at the post and on the turn, I would score. And so I started to build that into my free taking. So I would stand with my back to the goal, bounce, bounce the ball three times and always have the O'Neill's um, sign facing me in yes. my hand. And then I would go and sort of go through the motion um, of free taking. And I find that that is stuck with me. That's something that I would do now every single time. And, and that's, and it's having that process and knowing that it works and just sticking with it and, and going through that. Then I find that, you know, when you're at real pressure points in games, yeah. you, you know, obviously, you know that it's a pressure kick, but at the same time, if you follow the process, mm -hmm. then there's a good chance that it'll go over. So um that's magic there. And see you're talking about one of your strengths, I think one of your, like your top strengths is your finishing ability when in on goal. How did you develop that like seeing your extra training? Are you practicing going in on goal? Or where does that where does that come from? Yeah, definitely. It would be, you know, I would I I, I think I was fortunate enough to grow up playing soccer as well. And I think that has definitely helped. I think the two sports really complement each other and having I think like as a kid, I would have been my the ball control would have been really good. Like just doing keepy uppies, you know, with you know going out for hours and just keeping the ball up, you know, and getting trying to get more and more and in, into your hundreds or whatever of keep the keepy ups, and then you know doing it with the likes of a tennis ball and things like that. So I think like your ball control, like it all comes from like those early days where you know you're really comfortable on the ball. And so then, you know, when you are going, I think from that and also playing soccer, you know, your placement of the ball, like you just have more control over the ball. So I think then going on one-on-one -on -one under pressure, you know, with the goalkeeper, I think it's just actually, because it's something that we've been work, we've worked on a lot this year is, is not panicking in front when you are one-on-one -on -one and just placing the ball or taking the ball around the keeper, you know, and certainly that's something that we've done this year is, you know, reducing the 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 risk of 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 missing by rounding the keeper, so that you're you've an open net. But I suppose like I probably would have, I would, I love kind of those opportunities when you are one on one with a goalkeeper and you know getting to shoot on the goalkeeper. I suppose and like that has just been from you know in those sort of practice sessions that you're you're taking the goalkeeper one on one or whatever, and you're placing the ball in the corners and. It just, it's just taken a lot of time. And I think a lot of that comes from confidence and, and just but being really comfortable on the ball. I see there, you talked about placing the ball. And for younger players, got there, like, see in terms of, like I've seen you rifle the ball, but in terms of percentage of power, when you're saying place the ball for younger players, like is that like a, are you going at like a 80%, 70% in terms of how hard you're hit, hitting it? Yeah, often like I, I think, yeah, about, about 70%, I would say, because... Mm -hmm often when you are rifling the ball and if you hit that ball as hard as you can the ball is either going to go over the bar or it's going to go straight down the middle you know like you lose you lose control over the over the ball the harder you hit the ball so often like i have a tendency to be giving you away everything not that there'll be too i would say too many of my opponents watching but at the same time you know i would sort of be going and because i'm so predominantly right footed you know i'll nearly almost slow up in front of the goal and then just side foot the ball to the right hand side um you know or or sort of in down into the left hand corner but i think like you really have to take away but that comes with confidence you know and get in front of the goal and knowing i actually just need to slide this past you know, without great pressure, because I think I've missed that many times, Peter, that I probably know now that, like, you know, I, I think sometimes you, you can be fortunate enough to, to get the rub of the green almost when you rifle the ball up into the top corner. I, I, I've probably missed a good few of them to know that, 
there's a time and a place almost for that and depending on as well who's it's understanding the game that the, the points in the game when you know that is required if you're under pressure and you need a goal you know there's going to be times when you're going to be hitting the ball with greater greater force um and it's, it's i think it just comes down to the more that you play and getting into those positions and feeling comfortable with those positions listening to those things magic claire and nick surely claire timney's never missed a big free Oh Jesus! I definitely miss a good. I'm sure I can't really remember any specific one that was a real howler or a, you know one that's really critical. But there's certainly, I I think um sort of your mental strength, um as a footballer as you get older you obviously become more confident and you've been in these scenarios before. And I, and I definitely think as a younger player at times I would have struggled. You you often sort of see. Some players that will, if they miss, say, their first or second one, you know that they're going to, that's going to get into their head mm-hmm. and it's going to affect the rest of their game. So I I think, I, I remember someone telling me that, um, I remember being double marked against, playing against St. Gold and I and I had heard after the game that the manager had said, get on top of Claire Timoney. If she misses the first one, she'll miss the rest of the game. And I remember that was the best thing that I ever heard because I thought, right, okay, that's what he thinks. Well, I'm going to prove him wrong. And so I remember, I, I remember after that thinking, right, if I miss, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. I'll get the next one, you know, and it's like wiping that slate clean. Like if you miss, it's gone. Like you can't, you know, and it's kind of like any mistake in, in the pitch. And I would always sort of say that to people. It's like, you make a mistake, everyone is going to make a mistake in the game there's not one person that's going to have a perfect game so you know it's and I think the mental strength side of the game is so important and because if you can wipe that slate clean and move on to the next shot and you know it's building on the little successes you know during the game that that's that's how you will build in your performance Um, and so it's just it's it's not focusing on those negative things and letting that impact your whole game because it can be very easy you know if you miss that first or second shot or whatever you can think oh this is going to be one of these games and it's all the self-talk you can start to talk to your you talk to yourself almost and say oh you know my players got the better of me and it, you know it's all those things and it, that's still very um it's so important in the game today because the mental side of things and um, we were playing obviously before um, playing against Donna Moyne and Connor Lavery from Koku came in to speak to us and he was saying like you, like you need to get into their head if you can get into their head in the first few minutes of the game it'll rattle people so I, I think I've been very aware and conscious and, and I've seen like players over the years come on and some someone coming on playing centre half back and marking me and you know really trying to roughen me up or whatever and I think I suppose experience teaches you a lot, you know, that you see that coming on. But I think the mental side of the game is really important. And as a young player, that's something that, you know, it's new to you as well, because, you know, being in those positions where you're, you know, feeling or whatever, and it's like picking yourself up or, you know, the mental side of the game, I think you probably don't spend too much time on, you know, and it's, it's, it's nearly an individual thing rather than a team, you know, you can be sort of saying, right, you guys pick yourself up but you know it's it's um I think as a young person I definitely think my game improved because of my the mental side of things and it probably actually did was stem by hearing someone say to me listen oh you'll get like Claire Timoney like if you get on top of her and it's like that proving someone wrong almost as well so so you talked about uh as a star player in a team there is those tactics where your a player's been put on to rough you up or you're getting double teamed. So what advice would you give to that player? If someone's doing that, it's maybe the ego, sometimes your ego, your ego might get hit in that maybe I have to like, like be physical back, but obviously that's yeah. not, maybe not the right thing to do. What would you, advice would you give to a younger player who is getting that type of um, tactics on? You know what? I would use it as, as um, confidence almost and kind of think, right, well, if I'm being double marked, they know that I'm a threat, mm-hmm. you know, but it's, it's almost like, uh, for, for in that instance I almost want to I'll push harder almost because I'm like I'm going to show them that I can get in front of both of these guys and I will I for I know like a, a playing that role where I maybe would be full forward being double marked or having a sweeper sitting in front of you 
be constantly moving, constantly, constantly moving, so that the player's always having to think where where you are. They're not focusing as much as where the ball is coming in. So the more you're moving around and making it difficult for a defender, then they're 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 thinking about where you are rather than where the ball. So you've got vision of where the ball is at all times. So I always find that that I kind of used it as a as a more of a confidence thing. I thought, well, you know what, like let let me try and sort of outplay you know these two players or or whatever. So um or and I think it's just I think it's if someone's sort of trying to push you off the ball or dig you or here and there or whatever. You know, it's sort of it's just ensuring that that doesn't get into your head that oh this person's gonna you know get 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 on top of me. And I think confidence is just a massive part of the game, and it's very easy to say that oh you know have confidence, but and that probably comes you know with a bit of experience as well. But um, that's sort of how I would have dealt with it. So, but surely, Claire, you've never been dropped from a team. Um, no, I definitely have been. <laughs> I I'll never forget. Um, probably. And it was it was probably the making of me being dropped. I had I was playing for Jordanstown, um, and I I had I'd played obviously Alamina up for a number of years, and I was in the county setup, and that was probably the highest level that I had played. And then I moved into to Jordanstown, and I was playing with my first year in Jordanstown. I was playing with unbelievable footballers, like from all counties in in Ulster, and at that time Ulster football was probably was thriving. It was probably better than what it is at the moment. Mm-hmm. And the likes of your players from Tyrone and Armagh, those players were, you know, it, it was it was such a, a great time for me in my development. I remember um, Greg McGonagall, who was the manager at the time, had sort of, he was sort of saying, oh, he was saying to the team, you know, Claire Timoney was coming into this team or whatever. And I suppose he was driving an expectation. And I was, it was probably the first time I'd gone into an environment where I wasn't probably the strongest player in the team. And I was going into an environment where I was one a player and certainly not the strongest in the team. There were so many strong players. And like that kind of, you know, going into that environment and it's very different from what you're used to and having to really push yourself and challenge yourself. And I remember that one of the first games for Jordanstown we were playing, Queens and Jordanstown at the time, the rivalry was just created. It was it was rife. And I remember Greg before the game saying, This will be the biggest game of your life. And um and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And I was playing centre half forward and I had I'm talking about misses, um, I had a I had a penalty and I missed the penalty and I was just shocking the rest of the game. And I think because too I was playing with such strong players and I, I was I just felt like I'd let myself down so much and after that I got dropped I was dropped um and because of my performance was it was terrible that that particular game and that was one of the first games for Jordanstown and I didn't play for the rest of the like I didn't play any game the rest of the league I was the last sub to be used I think in the in in the final game the league final the college's league final and I had I, I kind of had I was training so hard like my first year at uni I did like the first the first semester normally people are drinking the heads of themselves I didn't drink the whole semester because I was like I need I, I was the training was so brilliant and I loved it and I wanted to wanted to get back on the team and so I was training really hard but it just wasn't it wasn't happening I wasn't getting on so um it just so happened then I think in the start of the next next the sort of it was after Christmas the same year and we were going into the sort of O'Connor Cup that was sort of the period so that's the equivalent to the Sigerson mm-hmm. um and we had a few friendlies running up to that and I remember we played against we were playing against Tyrone and at this stage I was just on the bench so I was like oh geez it's gonna be a chilly one tonight it's like January or something and I was thinking god I'm gonna be freezing on this bench you know, and I had kind of accepted probably a little bit that the, the, the girls on the team were really strong. But I just by chance, I think one of the players who would generally was playing, I didn't realize had been injured. So he was like, Claire, you're going on there at centre half forward. So I didn't have to, I didn't think up think about it. And I went straight on to the to the game. And like I probably played one of the best games of football that I'd played. And I think I was playing with no pressure or no expectation. 
And I'd obviously built up this expectation in my head, like playing with a lot of these girls. And I just played with probably a bit of freedom. And I remember after the game, like I, I, I knew myself that I had played well. And I think the other one, of the, I remember somebody saying, oh, the other man, the manager at Trones asking who you are. Mm-hmm. And like for me to be kind of pulled out of like that pool of players, you know, to ask who I was sort of thing. I was thinking, oh, wow. So, and I think that then gave me confidence. And so then I started every game after that um, for the rest of the year. And we won the O'Connor Cup, which is the first time Jordanstown had ever done it. And they haven't done it since, unfortunately, either. But um, it was it was amazing. But it was a really good, I think it was a great kind of lesson in some ways too, you know. And, you know, like I was working, I was working really hard in training to try and yes. get on. And it just felt like, I think, and I suppose it's just maybe seizing the opportunity when you get the opportunity to kind of get back in, you know. So. So staying ready to, to so the so the shock the shock of getting dropped for one of the first times as a forward, your confidence is going to be hit. So you're steady, you stayed ready. And did yeah. you ever talk to the manager? Did you say like, do you ever um, say why am I not on? And would you what advice would you give the younger? You know manager? what? At the time, I didn't. Um, and I. I it's, it sounds ridiculous. Well, I think I hadn't been in the position too often that I was, um, you know, I had been dropped, but I also knew the reason why I had been dropped because I wasn't good enough and I didn't perform in that, on that game. So I knew that I just needed another, I needed another opportunity, but my confidence was definitely knocked. And I think, you know, I think then just from working hard and training and just always keeping my hand in there and like knowing that, like he knew that I was like I was gonna come on and and be ready. Um, I think that's sort of what you know was, was sort of the good sort of lesson in it. Mm-hmm. See the see your teammates were you know were your, was any teammates were they were they give you encouragement during training and things like that? Oh yeah, I I think the 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 team at that particular time the intensity of the training sessions you know that competition was driving me to become better you know and there was always encouragement we had such a fantastic team that year you know and that you wanted to be part of that team because the camaraderie and everything that was going on like we would batter each other in training but that's exactly what then was brought on onto the pitch and we would have fought to the nail for each other like you know and that's that's what i've seen in successful teams that's what the difference is um and so, yeah, I think it, it you you would there would have been you know words of encouragement and like as the freshers sort of coming in to that team, you know you kind of would be keeping each other, but there was always there was still that competitiveness amongst us too. You 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 know because you know your spot could be taken and so, somebody else wanted your spot, so that competition really drove I think me personally. Um, do you, do you know you're talking about they talk about um uh, they talk about imposter syndrome. Uh, in sports and just in life in general, but in sports, you know, you were coming from a so-called, you know, you know so-called uh, a smaller kind of, uh, you know, a smaller kind of these superstars. Did whenever you went into these teams, you know, did you feel like, like, uh, you know, something? Did you ever get that imposter syndrome? And how did you handle that and realize that, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm as good as these people because there's lots of young players out there that get that feeling when they go to those higher levels. Yeah, definitely. And it's kind of can nearly be the making or the breaking of you, you know, by going into these teams. And I think there's an el- a little element of luck to you and people around you too. Like, I think, like your coach, I, I wouldn't have had like a massive relationship. I wouldn't have been, you know, with, with the coach. But at the same time, I knew that he, he respected me and I knew he thought I was a good player. And I certainly was aware of that. Like, so I think, you know, getting the nod or knowing that, you know, you have that from from your peers and, you know, that they sort of respect you going into that. Um, I think that certainly helps to sort of to be able to thrive in that environment. But, you know, there's definitely environments where I've been in and it's hostile, you know, and it's it's like for someone coming in, it's very difficult, and it you could very easily sort of crumble away and start to really doubt yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen it. I've seen it sort of in um in soccer teams and, and things like that. You know where where people do come in, and it just they have such potential, mm-hmm. and you know they just sort of don't nearly believe. I think in themselves, and then that sort of is just you know 
the end of that almost in some ways but I think in terms of overcoming that I suppose it, it's just having confidence and and playing to your strengths you know whatever you do well knowing what your strengths are and then really using those strengths um that's certainly something to kind of when you go into those scenarios you have to have belief in yourself because if you if you if you do you start doubting yourself it can be a you know, it can be a long road for you to nearly get back but I think it does there can be elements Peter of luck though when you know that you kind of get something happens you know and you're like you know I have got this you know I know I'm good enough you know right. so and, and then that's how you I think I think having a little bit of confidence mm-hmm. you know but also trying to like I think the one great thing about sport is the, the teamwork and you come across so many different types of players you know and it's trying to like you're nearly trying to weigh people up as well but I think you almost have to play your way into a team as well and try and understand how can I kind of get into this team that people you know respect me and, and like me as a person and want me to be their teammate. So is there any mm-hmm. players uh, the teammates you had growing up that really pushed you? Ashton Quinn was um, played for Money Glass and and was like a teammate in school and I also played county football with her too and she's probably one of the most um, underrated players like she was phenomenal and she pushed me so much because there's that element when you're growing up that you want to be the best and we were always neck and neck like with like you know when you would have been in sports day and yeah. like it would have been me and her you know like it was all it was always she was always the the other one she was so skillful and so like her reading of the game so she would have been a center half back and I would have been a center half forward so we weren't competing for the same spot but she was just she was a she was a leader that wouldn't have said too much and she was so she she for me like growing up like we we probably pushed each other I would have would have thought um but she was fantastic um so she she definitely from school would have been a great um teammate and I would have learned a lot from her and then because I played county football for such a long time too I guess sort of I'd said like the McCann sisters um would have been you know would have been a great sort of just how they carry themselves and with that Caroline Kelly who was a very good friend of uh, Jardine she played in the full forward line and so that was someone that you know obviously a position that I had played at times genuinely I've never seen someone go the way she battled like um, to this day I've never seen and I haven't seen a player like her since because her commitment to the ball and to playing was just incredible like she would have just put her head where you wouldn't put your foot and you know would never have given up like never say die attitude like she just epitomized that um so she it was brilliant playing against those players and they they were a few years older than me so I always sort of looked up to them and and then Catherine Mullen as well was another one that played on from football and she's a good friend of mine um you know and she always played like center half back too so we would have marked each other quite a bit too and sort of similar to Kathy Conway too would have been a player that would have been driving forward and you you have these half backs that are driving out of defense and left in a team and that's exactly what she would have done so I love playing with her, but not playing against her a lot of the times. But those are the players like that I suppose, and a lot of them, you know, they are like your, your you know, good friends. That you see qualities in them that like you know that that make teams better. And it's not necessarily always for the footballing ability. It's actually sometimes you know for the kind of that determination and and like the heart that's behind them. You know, so um yeah, and and then through. The likes of Jordanstown, there was, I could name like one to 15, the entire team was, they were amazing footballers and like I learned a huge amount from, from, from them as well. So yeah, um, yeah, there was a lot of really good players throughout my career. So, I think, you know, you're someone who's won all Ireland's, you know, played for Ulster, you know, you've won all, you've played in the Champions League for Linfield, you've got caps for Northern Ireland and you scored and you get caps for Northern Ireland. Like, was there ever any players out there that just stood out to you? You were like, whoa, this is it. I think, well, like in Gaelic football, I suppose like Caroline O'Hanlon is someone that like you would like, I, and I'm still in awe of how she manages. Like she's, right. you know, obviously a doctor and, and plays netball for Northern Ireland and plays over in the Super League in England and then also plays for her club and her county and manages to do all of that. And like we played against... Park Robin last year in a 
in a friendly game and like I was just I was actually couldn't believe like she's she's maybe about two or three years older than me and but she literally would come she would she would take the ball off the goalkeeper and run the length of the pitch and score and she like she's the heartbeat of the car club and team too but she's the heartbeat of all the other teams that she plays in too and it's just it's amazing to see like a player like that to her commitment to sport you know and she's a real role model for so many girls in Northern Ireland like obviously in netball and in Gaelic football like so I suppose there there every now and again there are players like that that you know they go beyond and you know they, they've probably dedicated their life to sport and um, so you know they they are amazing and um and I suppose that like the, the, not necessarily the people that you you want to be like on in terms of the Gaelic pitch because it, you, you know they maybe play a very different position but you've just the utmost respect for them um I was fortunate enough to play and um, for Northern Ireland I, I get, it was actually just a friendly against Scotland um but Kim Little who plays for Arsenal um, I was playing midfield for my sins at the time. Like I, uh, like I would even hate to watch that game back. But like it was amazing to see the level, you know, the the skill level of someone. Like she was just skipping around the pitch, and I think we were beaten maybe with seven nil by Scotland that day. Um, but like it was incredible to see. You know, I I really enjoyed playing playing football and. But I, I always knew I was never going to be the level where you'd be playing in England or anything like that. But like just to see, you know, that level, what players can be like and how their footwork and their technique and their awareness of off and on the ball, like was just incredible. So I suppose like there's there's definitely moments like that that you've just been like have so much respect that you're just thinking, wow, like like they are incredible, you know. To see as well, like I'd love to dive in like to your like the actual individual you know or sorry team achievements individual achievements you've had and mm-hmm. i wouldn't do it justice here in this in this interview but like was there ever any you know top class top class soccer player was there any ever talk of going across the water or maybe to america or anything like that there was any chat about that or scouting or oh yeah at the moment it's 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 become like really um it's becoming more and more common which is amazing um in northern ireland so at the moment um so the first i think player that would have left um northern ireland to go over to england was simone mcgill and she played for everton Ever, yeah yeah she was play, played for Mid Ulster um, previously, and, and she sort of probably paved the way for a lot of girls going over to um, England. Um, and then more more recently, um, what about yourself? I mean, like, was was there ever any chat of yourself going over the trials? Um, I don't think I, I I just knew I wasn't good enough, Peter. To be honest with you, I I played football in America. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship when I was eighteen right. to America, um, and like thoroughly enjoyed myself and learned a lot of lessons there and it was brilliant for me but I, to be honest I suppose probably Gaelic football probably I, I, it sort of took over that um, and I, I sort of knew myself that I was my work rate in in on the soccer field was 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 great but technically I wouldn't have been as strong as other players and I suppose it's you just I think you know yourself like I probably I am I would critique myself a lot but at the same time I have an awareness of you know the ability abilities around me and playing Northern Ireland um you know I sort of dipped in and out of out of that team and at a senior level too you know I would have been I would have been on there and I, my fitness levels would have would have been something that would have been strong so that always you know carried you in games but technically I, I, I know I wasn't as strong as other players so um, but it's brilliant because of the last sort of year or two there's more and more girls like playing for Linfield last year Megan Bell is one of the brightest young players in Northern Ireland she's gone she went over to Durham initially and has now signed a professional contract with Rangers and um, so and Chloe McCarran has just gone over to Birmingham as well who played for Linfield last year as well so you know those girls for that to happen more is, is showing that there is a way for young people here that they can go and play in the likes of that, that yeah, the yeah. WSL and stuff so social media um is a big part of everyone's lives what advice would you give to specifically younger females out there you know in those formative years between you know the ages of 14 you know to 14 to 21 and maybe even through their 20s 
Yeah, I think it's 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 become part of life now. Like I think like when we were growing up, you'd have been watching TV in the evenings. Now you know people aren't. Like I'm sure we've all probably got you know you get a notification of your screen time maybe each week or whatever. And and it's crazy the amount of time that we do spend you know on social media on on our phones and and like an hour can pass like like that and you've yeah. been flicking through and and you know whatever. So I just think that like being mindful of the time that is spent on it and I know that like the more data that's out there on you as well like be my dad is always he he he's always saying like don't be sharing this or don't be putting yeah. this out and you know you put up pictures out there that's for the world you know like the more data there's out there it could be used nearly against you you wouldn't know what might happen down the line or, or whatever so it's just being mindful of what you post and what you control what you put out there on social media um as well but and and just i suppose you know not getting too i think a, a, i suppose young girls too because you know you see you see a lot of people yeah. on social media and people are filtered yes. to the to the hills on these things as well and like you know, I, I think it's always being mindful like what you see is not always the reality mm-hmm. of the situation you know and you often see so many people that are posting you know pictures and it's 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 so-called perfection Mm -hmm. you know but what's going on behind that screen is a very different reality you know so i would just say get outside and just live in the moment and go and climb mountains i feel like that's what i've been doing lately it's just but you know you know seeing what's outside i think with like the lockdown and everything a lot of people have been forced to go outside more and i just think like fresh air and those things are much better for your mental health and you know sitting and listen i'm on social media too so like you know and i spend probably too much time as well but i know that i i don't post too much and i don't nearly get bogged down on on things too much i see yeah uh, we go even more specific so there's a young there's a young girl out there like what was he specific a young girl out there 18 years old loves her sport and she's trying to stay focused and fulfilling her potential and she's looking on her phone on instagram and she's seeing all her friends out she's getting the FOMO what advice mm-hmm. tell me what would you what would you say to her in the moment I think you have to you have to go out to and enjoy these if you completely box yourself off and don't go you know don't go out in these things I don't think that that's good either so I think it's just about having a balance like I feel everything in life is about you know having a you have to have balance in your life so if you're going out too much something's going to suffer so like if you can balance these things then like that's where you'll get the best of both worlds and like you've got your friendships and you want to keep those friendships with you know people that you know friends at school maybe or whatever that don't play sport and I think it's you know it's just it's just knowing that maybe you're on the verge you know something is is too much then it's being mindful of that and thinking right okay well you know, if I'm going out this weekend, next weekend or whatever, how am I going to be? And uh, whether you're drinking or not, it's just knowing that how that's going to impact, say, your performance. There, that's like, there's been so much value you've brought to younger players out there and to current players just to get an insight into how you got to the level you were at. So there's so much nuggets. I, I'd hope sometime that we could maybe have another conversation and dive into those big, big games you had and learn about how you dealt with pressure. But there's so many nuggets yeah. of information for everyone out there. I just want to thank you so much for your time. I really no problem. It. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.